Hello again, everyone. My name is uh, Laurent Delegue. I'm an open source enthusiast uh, for more than 15 years at Uber. Okay, so now let me introduce our speaker today, Dr. Dano. He's an associate professor of practice who started in the George Washington University EMEC department in 2022. His research interests include improvement of complex engineered systems through robust system architecture, system thinking, model-based systems architecture and engineering, and system engineering practices. Prior to his current position, he worked as a systems engineer at BAE Systems for over 25 years. And during that time, he has served in numerous system engineering roles on multiple advanced defense systems. Finally, Dr. Dano has been an INCOSI member since uh, 2011, and he's a past president of the New England chapter a member of the Physics Honor Society and participates on numerous IEEE and DIA and INCOSI working groups. And without further ado, Dr. Dano, welcome on stage. The floor is yours. I will just activate your slides and we're good to go. So uh, let me just start with the motivation. You know, the motivation of this, in, in, when I was in industry, I was the architectural community of practice lead, which was basically tasked with improving the state of architecture throughout the company. And in doing so, I was looking for a way to come up with a, a way to architect systems and document the architecture in a way that every program can do and we make sure we have a solid architecture going forward. At the time, the, the Department of Defense Architecture Framework was really the only common denominator, which was, was created because of problems, fielded problems uh, related to architecture. And it forced you to think conceptual architecture, physical architecture, and you know the various ADM steps, but really not much. And it also wasn't very transdisciplinary. So once we started with the DODAF way, which was a good and a good first step, the second step to a model-based is what I was searching for. Um, I looked at many methods, language, tools, uh, and found a lot of generic things that could be used for architecture, but nothing that really focused on architecture. Uh, that's where uh, Stefan Lecomte comes in. Uh, he was kind enough to give an Incozy workshop about uh, probably about three, four years ago now on Capella, and the light bulb came on. This is it, something developed purely for architecture because of the importance of that to make a robust, complete transdisciplinary system. I was like, this has to be it. And I started working with it and eventually developed this methodology uh, with Stefan. Uh, we are presenting this at uh, IEEE uh, Recent Advances in System Science and Engineering in November. So there'll be a companion paper to this if you look for that uh, after November. Also, as, as a reward for those who stay on the whole uh, presentation, we'll give the link to the example I have of a missing person system, um, location system, and we'll give you the link so you get the files and the model and look at that. Because in the time, we can't obviously go through all the views of a whole architecture. Okay, so just quickly, we're gonna go over the systems architecture. Uh, the proposed uh, augmented uh, Arcadia method is, is what I call it. We'll go through the four ADM steps. I'll have a quick uh, conclusion, leave time uh, as mentioned for questions and answers. So starting with the system architecture overview, and it should be a pretty easy sell, if you will, to this audience that architecture is important. Uh, I did start with uh, the ISO IEEE definition from the 15288. You know, components, relationships to each other, the environment they're in, and the principles guiding their design evolution. I think that's a very good definition. If you pull the various documents, the NASA uh, Systems Engineering Handbook, the NCOSI Systems Engineering Handbook, any of the Defense Acquisition University or DOD guides or the ISO IEEE guides, all talk to the importance of architecture. I don't think, like I said, it's a hard sell for this group. In the system engineering handbook, they have a plot that shows up in a lot of architecture presentations, showing that 70% of the costs and capabilities of a system are determined by its system architecture. So if you think about that, if we have a good, solid, complete system architecture, 70% of the system is going to be solid. And it's going to be much easier to get over that goal line with that robust, complete system architecture we talked with. So it's ab abstractly, it's no more than if you think before you do, you're going to have better results. Architecture is that think first. 
And with Capella and some of its features, which we'll talk about in a couple of slides, it really focuses you on those very specific thinking exercises, systems thinking, taking one eight, you know, architectural development step at a time to facilitate that architecture. So what's the goal of the proposed methodology? The intent here was really to cover the space I was in. I was not looking to redo uh, you know, the US uh, government and model that. That is something that you would need an enterprise level tool. I know UAF comes up a lot, but this is really meant for the, what I put my estimate, 90% of the work that's out there in industry is small systems of systems, systems and subsystems. And that's really the target for this. And quite frankly, in, when I was in industry, 100% of what we architected was in this realm. Um, I also like to point out that there's some elements that need to be enhanced for completeness. And I think DODAF did a good job on some of that. So you'll see that this methodology proposes a subset of the Arcadia Capella method and supplemental views to go with it to ensure that you understand the programmatics, you better understand the CONOPS of the system, and then also the quality attributes and the illities. You know, no one wants to architect a great high-performing system that you can't produce, or it's not testable, or it's not supportable. You know, the, there's a long history of that out in fielded systems. So it really needs to be complete, and that's thus the augmentation to the Arcadia Capella, which is very capable right out of the box. I do like to point out my little oval down here in, in the corner. The 70% of the system that you're going to drive, if you're with good architecture, a lot of people don't quite picture the good architecture box. It's not just creating artifacts. So starting with the left, you need good customer inputs. If you don't have good customer inputs, you're not sure if your system is going to you know, be able to validate its way back to those conops. And it's a mix. Some customers are very systems, uh, I'll say, good, systems heavy, and they give you very good inputs. Other customers are short systems, and they really give you very, very high level, sometimes incomplete uh, inputs. And that, that's the role of the architect to help bridge those and complete those. But it's also important at the top, as you see, the decision analysis methods and requirements generation, those are driven from the artifacts, artifacts, they're derived from the artifacts, but they're really critical that they are part of it. If you just create artifacts, you don't get to that 70% solid system to move forward with. Similarly, the transdisciplinary element at the bottom, a lot of tools are, like, are generic, they don't force you to really look at that, but that's really important, especially as systems get more complex, testing becomes more complex, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the last piece, the, the model-based systems architecture, and I differ, purposely differentiate that from engineering because I think we need an architecture-centric solution to get that solid start on systems. And it consists of language, ADMs, or you apply your engineering standards to frameworks, uh, an MBSA tool, and ease of modeling. I know most people have seen Bruce Cameron's paper but uh, it resonated with me. That was some of my uh, issues that I had with uh, using some of the standard SysML elements. It's not that they were bad, it's a good language, but it, a very big adaptation curve. So as I looked for this solution, it had to have ease of modeling. And thus, that's why we, we after testing many, many elements out there and many products, that's where I landed on Arcadia Capella because it has these uh, ease of use is right out of there. This is my top five of the benefits of Capella. There's probably a, a couple dozen well beyond this, but fundamentally it was architected and designed to meet, to, to develop architectures right out of the, right out of the box. It's doing exactly what I wanted it to do. Um, it aligns with 15288, which talks about the first architecture step being abstraction to think what are the entities, what are the concepts, the operational concepts. A lot of tools just don't do that. They very focus inward as soon as you start the first ADM step, whereas Capella abstracts to get that holistic thinking that really draws a solid con op 
before you define the system and subsystems and work your way down the road. It enforces methodology rules because it's instance-based. So if I pull a function, it knows it's a function. If I pull an activity, it knows it's an activity. I don't have to stereotype things in the background, which is part of the difficulty with some of the other languages. So ultimately, it results in reduced operator workload, reduced modeling time, and reduced modeling errors, exactly what we're looking for. Um, common methods in each step are also helpful to help the learning curve. The learning curve is actually quite low. Once you learn thing in one step, it's repeatable in other steps. And then you can transfer elements between the steps to automate some of the things that often are error prone if you're doing it manually by creating view after view after view. Uh, one other thing that really uh, I was impressed with is if you look at USUM, which is architecture for uh, system L based, it's very, it's all use case based. So if you come up with all the use cases, then you probably will be able to derive all your functionality, but that's very hard. Um, more traditional straight decomposition finds you a lot of functions too, but may not find ones that when you look at the threads and the use cases they find. And the beauty with Capella is they really take the operational capabilities up from that first ADM step and drive it both ways. So you really flush out the functionality. I've never seen another tool be able to do it that easily and facil facilitated by the tool. Uh, common libraries, I'm not gonna get into some of the extra elements. There are requirements, plugins, and a lot of good plugins that let you go. Uh, I'll close this slide by, I get asked a lot, well, couldn't you do this, this methodology using other languages and tools? And the answer is yes, you could, but you won't have these advantages. It's gonna take you longer to model, you're gonna have more error prone models, and it, it's gonna be a significantly higher learning curve. So can you do it? Yes, does it make sense to do it? No. Um, and again, it comes back to being an architecture centric by architecture and design. You, you, can't, you can't beat that. So what are the pieces of the proposed methodology? As you can see, the first four steps of uh, Capella up there in the top left, uh, it basically doesn't use the, the fifth uh, layer there, which you, you certainly can, but it's not part of this methodology. One of my value statements when I was looking for an approach was to get a high fidelity architecture, but with the minimum set of views. So there are many things as we go through the methodology, there are many optional views. They're great if you can do them, but I was trying to find that minimum set that gets us what we need. So we got that uh, from Arcadia, the first four ADM steps. We also defined an order for those steps uh, to minimize the workflow and again, uh, which steps to do. The supplemental artifacts are basically, uh, they're images that are created and then pasted into the model. So they're not actually part of the model, but they're in the model. Because one of the other value statements that we're looking for is that no PowerPoint. <laughs> so that you open the tool, you review the tool at a mo architecture model review and everything's in the tool. So some of the supplemental ones, like you see the OV1 there, you basically can paste the image in a tool. So it's part of the tool. It can be part of the review, but not. Uh, it doesn't really get tied into the model. Similarly, on the, the end, to make sure that all the illities are in there, uh, we basically check it against you know, what I'll call heuristic checklists. So questions, have you checked this? Have you checked that? Things that will really be tied into your engineering process, but ensure that you gave each of the illities due diligence. And the result is you're going to get a transdisciplinary architecture out. The example I put in the model files that we'll point to at the end is this missing person locator system. Just real quick, we have a person lost at sea with a radio. The radio gets detected, it gets sent back to a control center. They launch a UAV to go out and geolocate the lost person. And then when it does, it sends it back and the search party goes out and rescues them. Uh, the model is in 6.0, so if you do download it, you have to update it to 6.1 if you're using 6.1. Oops, excuse me. Okay, so going through the steps. Okay, so the operational analysis, and all of these are going to start basically the same way, okay? You're going to do trades and analysis, 
to come up with the multiple, you know, and use multiple systems thinking techniques for each level. So at the first level, it may be option generation. When you get to the logical architecture, break into subsystems, it may be driven by standards. If you look at an automobile breaking down into chassis, body, you know, a powertrain, drivetrain, a lot of that's driven by standards of elements you need. So there's a lot of elements that come into that. I'm not going to obviously do decision analysis here while I'm talking, but I, I just want to stress the importance of good decision analysis, multiple techniques throughout each ADM step. Uh, you see the list below is all the views. Optional ones are not bolded. The ones that are required are bolded. Uh, one other strength of Capella is the data model and interface model with every step of the ADM. Uh, I, I believe I have one of those in here, but for, for space, you just I can't post them all here. So again, I refer you to the model at the end. Um, but this really covers the first two steps in the 15288, especially that abstraction that I talked about. Okay, these are example of the supplemental views uh, that go up front. You know, architecture review, my assumption is that there is going to be a formalized architecture in a model and you're gonna review that model. There'll be staff that reviews it, independent assessors that make sure the architecture is complete. And usually in companies, that is part of the bid process because usually the, the architecture is done for a proposal typically. So that's really the flow of all these project documents, schedule, cost, operation involvement, all of those are dimensions for the architecture that you need. A, a great product that doesn't meet cost or schedule is, is not a great product. So any customer requirements, value statements that will carry through, maybe it's not a functionality, I want a robust system. Well, that could be a lot of things, but if you carry that value statement through your derivation, you could have that dialogue with the customer. You are talking redundancy, are you talking you know, what type of resiliency are, are you, are you you know, are you looking for? And you don't lose those elements. Then some elements are right out of the DODAP views because they're just a time proven to be a great way to talk about systems up front. Uh, I would typically bring an OV1 and get in front of a whiteboard with a customer and a lot of good came out of that. So that's the motivation for these. OV1 is the classic graphic that I showed uh, for the missing person locator. AV1, AV2 are really just documenting some of the important supplemental information that goes with the, uh, the proposal, if you will, or the architecture. Uh, so it's a mix of DODAF and programmatic views. All of them pasted into the model. Okay, so the, the first ADM step is operational analysis. And here's the elements that it's getting for you. It really is Let's think holistically. Let's think of the domain that we're trying to get or this con up we're trying to meet. What are all the entities and actors that are part of it? Now, you haven't defined the system yet. Now, I teach this methodology I'm showing you in, in one of the classes here at George Washington, the master's students. And this is almost the interesting one because you got to get them to think abstractly in that they don't know the system. And because once you get them over that threshold, they really come up with some great brainstorming and some great uh, you know, identification of the stakeholders, the entities. Uh, the next one is operational capabilities at a very high level. What does it have to do? As I mentioned, this will boil down to both the functional decomp traditionally through activities and functions, as well as through missions and system capabilities down to use cases. The OAB takes those operational, so still very high level above what I would call functional requirements that you'd see in a the specification. They're at the next layer below, but these are the, the step that you now decompose from those operational capabilities, activities, the orange boxes, and now you're gonna decompose them down to functions in the next step. But you've defined the domain and problem space before you cut things out that perhaps you shouldn't have. So that's really the goal of the first uh, ADM step. Okay, the second step here, uh, same thing with the decision analysis. You can see the bold ones are the required. Uh, here's where the first interface element comes in, the IS, and that's carried on through and updated for uh, initially external as you define the system, internal, and then as you 
go further down, you update that as you go. Same with the data. You, st you start with packages, just general message types, then internal, external, then messages and, and exchanges, and then properties of message, messages and exchanges. So it's a really great way to capture the data. Because of the importance of interfaces, typically in architecture reviews I've been to, those are very good. Uh, typically, the data is very weak. You know, DODAF added in a, a data information view, um, but it really didn't allow for the richness in defining the messages. It was, again, very PowerPoint-based, even, even UPDM, which is the model version, uh, really didn't get it done, quite frankly. Uh, whereas here, it, you carry it through all the layers. So the second ADM step, system analysis. And uh, for my class, they all loved the, the CSA diagram because when you told them they just had to clip off whatever is in the system and leave the other elements external, they, they love that. And, and it is, it's, it's, it's an example of how they made, they architect and design this tool and thus why we chose Capella because it's stuff like that that really reduces the workload and the chance of error. So uh, in this system, a system, I had four elements that were in the system. I just pruned them out of the CSA and, and moved on. Uh, here's on the bottom left. I don't know if you can see my pointer. I'm sorry if you can't. The bottom left, uh, you can see how the, the once operational capabilities are now missions and they get uh, decomposed into system uh, capabilities, aka use cases. And in the next step, we'll actually run functional chains through the logical architecture diagram, which was the next step. And that's something that you'll vet with the customer. Here's an example of the interface uh, diagram. So this is the external. You define the system and then all the external elements. It shows the interfaces and interchange with them. And each layer ends with an architecture diagram as the last one had an operational architecture diagram. This is the system architecture diagram, also known as the functional architecture. And you can see these are now decomposed from those orange activity blocks in the step above for the system. Outside of the system, you don't necessarily need to decompose any further. But now this is at the level where you start seeing the functionality break out or certainly system specifications would have that level of functional requirement. Uh, as you go through the various layers, you may find elements that need performance requirements as well, derived for the functional requirements. So this is about the level you're at. The third level, the third ADM step is logical architecture. And like the other steps, decision analysis is absolutely critical, especially here where you're breaking it up into subsystems. Uh, I, I won't go into modularity too much, but modularity is born in step three and four in this process. This at a high level at the subsystem level, as you start dividing that up, you have to start taking account production and elements like that to make sure the modularity in design and architecture, if you will, align with that modularity in production because they need to be lockstep. So some of those Transdisciplinary trades really need to be worked at this level. Uh, the elements, again, are uh, bolded. MSM is a state mode a diagram or machine, and that's typically, that can be done in any step. Our, in our methodology, we put it here in the logical architecture. A Sleto refers this to the glass box view, which I love because you can see the pieces starting to form, but they're not gelled yet, like they will be in the physical architecture. So I thought that was a, a brilliant uh, name right there. Okay, logical and system threads. Again, to make it easy on the operator, I get my logical system. I just define my subsystems and link it to it. it, it it's that easy. Um, I can make uh, the interface diagrams between my internal elements here. I do show uh, some of the, the interface diagrams here. Here's my system architecture, excuse me, my logical architecture diagram. Um, in this case here, and it's hard to see, but the four subsystems, one, two, three, and four, uh, it looks a lot like the SAB because the way it's laid out, as I did my system of system, it kind of has natural aggregation to it. 
So it actually makes doing system of systems uh, you know, and going from the SAB to the lab actually quite easy. Now, I have another example that I use in that class I teach, which is for a car. And the car, because of a lot of the standards that drive functionality, more so, you know, along with the derived functional requirements, uh, it scrambled it up a little bit, but still there's a lot of leverage from the SAB to the lab and ultimately to the physical architecture diagram we'll talk about next. This is one of the things, one of the features that I, I absolutely loved uh, and still do in, in Capella. Uh, you know, the systems functional review is a requirement for US DOD systems. However, many times it's missed. And in my opinion, the systems functional review is the most critical one because if you don't have all your functions defined and laid out, you don't know what you're going to get. And if you're missing elements, they're not going to magically appear as you go through the requirements phase and design phase. Maybe somebody will figure it out, but most likely not. You're going to have a fielded system now that has gaps and capabilities. So this is a way to come up with views quickly to get in front of the customer and do early system validation, which is critical and the most important part of SFR. So what do you do? You basically click on the path that you want. So I can define a thread and I, you know, in the older version, you clicked the, uh, the element, the function and the interchange. Now we just click the interchanges. At the end of the day, it makes this nice little colored path. I can show multiple paths. It gives you a different color as you add different threads to it. Very, very powerful and simple. And then going through the menus, you create a functional chain, which is shown here, which just takes the elements that you highlighted and you immediately turn into a scenario diagram, in this case, a functional scenario diagram with all the elements just pulled over. No chance to, for a mistake is pulling the right functions, the right interfaces, and it's very, very easy to do. So I would do this for all the use cases, and I did programs where I did this. I did all the use cases with Capella, even if we had some elements were a system L-based model, and got that in front of the customer. And the results were fantastic. We actually, one customer liked it so much, we had weekly meetings and just walked use case to use case. And most of them were, were spot on, but we got insight into why they wanted things a certain way. Then there were some, admittedly, that, well, that's what we put in the spec, but here's what we really want. Could you have done that? And in some cases, you know, it's early enough in the, in the program where we could do what they wanted. Other cases, it was an increase in scope, but at least we knew that we could budget for it in the future. Very, very powerful element. Um, and one of the main reasons that I really like this tool it's just so easy to create these diagrams. You can also do entities as your lifelines. You do various you know, the subsystems as your lifelines. Uh, the tool will only let you put interchanges that have been defined previously. So a very good error uh, correct or error prevention uh, in the tool inherently. So going on to the last step, the physical architecture. Uh, this is really done in two steps. I, I will repeat the importance of modularity. You did the subsystem modularity, but now if you want to swap cards, you want to swap boxes, whatever you want to swap out when you're putting the modularity lines in, this is where it's born. You know, yes, the subsystems divvied it up certainly, and that aligns probably more with production. But here, if you're looking at modular in use, as most defense systems are, or they want to just have a system go over a 40 year run, well, so the standards start coming into here looking for open interfaces. There's a tool uh, called the Key Open Subsystem Tool that was part of MOSA, Modular Open System Approach, that actually helped users define what's going to change in their system, look for open standards that meet those interfaces instead of anything perhaps proprietary. And it's a very, very good tool. There's a few papers out there on it that you could go read if you're interested. Uh, the physical architecture, a lot of these elements here will be updated as needed if you change any internal, external interfaces, if you uh, brought the data model down maybe one step further or something with the state mode machine. But basically, it's going to use these two to create your white box view. You're going to see all your interfaces. And the beauty of it is, is because they can leaf 
elements in this model. The physical architecture, you're going to create one with your functional architecture overlaid on the behavioral architecture. And then that gets overlaid on top of the, the structural architecture. So some other tools really struggled with the handoffs between the behavior side and the structural side. This, it, it's just spot on. It, it's almost seamless. So here shows the really the two steps in the physical architecture view. So you start with the, and this looks a lot like the lab, except the logical system goes away and these are my subsystems. And now I'm defining in them, I'm allocating the functions to hardware, software, firmware, GPU, ASIC, you know, whatever is appropriate based on performance, based on heuristics, based on what's available in the COTS world, what's available in the leverage from my own company world. Uh, that all comes into play to make these uh, decisions on what you're going to use. Uh, elements of functions are aggregated based on common functionality to keep them grouped together and try to minimize coupling between elements that really need to, to belong together. Or, you know, so I'm not pushing like uh, wideband data all over the network just to filter it at one spot. You know, I would more likely filter it in a spot. So I'm only passing narrow band data around the network and not clogging up the network. So a lot of decisions and trades like that will go into this. So I, I don't want to not stress it here because it's really critical to doing this step right. Then I take my behavioral architecture with the functions aggregated and allocated in. And then I do the final step in the physical, physical architecture of partitioning it to physical elements, which are here in yellow. So this little cartoon on the bottom right kind of shows it. I have a configuration item, piece of hardware. I have an allocated uh, group of elements. And then I have the functionality, whether it's a single function or aggregated functions in that. And this is where the architecture uh, ends, but it's all right there. Uh, Capella also has some nice features where I could click on any of these elements, function, behavior, or physical, and uh, I could put links. So maybe I have a nominal uh, element that I'm thinking of for that or an example. I did this for antennas. I would find an antenna close to what I thought I was going to use to just give an idea to the reviewer of the model. Oh, this is what they're thinking. And there's actually some great online uh, videos by Tony Komar uh, with his solar uh, phone charger. These shows a lot of tips and tricks like that. So I would certainly... Uh, have you reach out and see those on YouTube. The elements, and this is really critical to really tie it all together. Okay, we, we've done some very rigorous steps, very focused. We looked at our programmatics up front to make sure we didn't miss uh, cost schedule value statements from the customer. But this is something that really is so often missed. Um, it's looking at it so across all the disciplines. Now, the architect or whoever's uh, tasked with doing the architecture and going through all these, these views that we just showed has to make sure that the stakeholders are invited back in the first step or even before the first step when you're talking about brainstorming and some of the concepts and stakeholders uh, identification, et cetera. That's where they start. If you get to this point and then bring in a maintainability person and there's no bit functionality derived and there is no bit operational capability that forced it to be decomposed and derived, you're stuck. I mean, yes, you can go back and put it in, but that's not the time to do it. You know, when in the class, I, I have all the kids have a testability element in their OEBD. I have them put the environment, the OEBD, and then one maintainability environment to make sure things like bit, test, software upgrades, patches, all that stuff has that top level element that it can be de decomposed out of. So that's one way, but also getting the SMEs involved early is absolutely critical. Uh, when I audit programs, I'm still an auditor on my old company on some programs. I'll usually pick one of the 11 you see on the side and ask them, you know, who's your logistician? Who's doing your training updates? Uh, and if I get the, the you know, I don't know, that, that's a bad sign. And even more so if you start talking reliability or safety or maintainability. If they haven't baked that into the architecture from the start, you, you almost have to start over. So 
basically what it is, a list of elements you need. The other elements are, um, you know, some elements will have mission planning, mission simulators, post-mission processing, some things that don't really fall under the illities but are part of the system. You know, testability, it's important to point out that that is both development test to support production and then to support fielded systems. And that's why I have them put in the OAB, uh, you know, something to hold for testability of the system. So those, to make sure those requirements get derived eventually. Uh, value statements, you know, MOSA is, is, is mandated. It's actually been mandated four times. Um, you need to make sure you have modular systems, both at the subsystem level at the logical architecture, and then the next layer down in the physical architecture. And then finally, those decision analyses that I talked about, those are as much of the architecture as these artifacts. I'm not saying you're going to bake them into the model, but the links and where they are and what you did and maybe a summary of them do get pasted into here, even if it is just links to a shared area that has all your decision analysis. But it's key that you have that. So if somebody picks up the architecture or say through the bid process and two protests, you're doing this a year later, things may have changed. Technology is moving very fast. Maybe some of your architectural trays are now would be different because there's better technology out there. So it's really important to document that. And this is really the, the crux of the supplemental views at the end. Risks and opportunities, again, so that stays with the package. And typically the qualification roadmap is something important. For real complex systems, the qualification is a long period, a lot of activities that you have to do. So usually in the architecture reviews, I always ask to have that up front. You know, if you need a range that takes two years to get, well, you better start on it right away. Or if you've got to increase production going back to the ILDs and updo your, you know, uh, upgrade your lines, that doesn't happen overnight. So that's why those elements were all in there. Here's just an example for testability. So, you know, general high level question, does it cover all aspects of testability? Was there testability representatives? If the answer is yes to that one, typically you're okay. When that's a no and, you know, somebody's going to, oh, I, I know testability. You know, maybe they do, maybe they don't. And, you know, but it's hard to know all those illities, I tell you. Um, so some of the questions here, development test needs, test equipment, production test needs, sustainment, outfielded equipment test needs. Did you consider them? Capital assets that you need for tests. Did you consider them? System test point strategy into cards. Uh, we once had uh, an RF card that it was, we were measuring the delays through the card. Uh, and once we got through a mixer, it was a little tough to measure that. And we actually, in the second build, we actually started putting test points in, which made some of these measurements much, much easier to do. So you, some of that will come from design but the mindset should come from the architecture that that is important to, testability is important. You got to decide what level it is and how you're going to do that. You know, bit self-test, uh, lessons learned is another thing. You know, if people are learning lessons, they should use them. You know, that saves a lot of time, money, and, you know, especially for software, you know, software is very big on leverage because there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into getting software right that you don't just want to throw it out and start again. Um, preliminary testability requirements, et cetera. So that's just an example of, uh, in this case, testability. But you, this will happen for all the illities and all the other elements I discussed in the last slide. And it really has to align with your engineering process. If you're making commodity items and you're just shooting them out and they're throwaways, then maybe testability doesn't matter. So it will vary on what you're doing, what the product is, and I also like to point out that this whole process or the, this, this whole methodology we're proposing, it works for engineer systems and it also works for socio-technical systems. Exactly the same way, instead of a hard cable interface, you may actually have a process or policy approval that goes from organization A to organization B. But the methodology still holds, but some of these illities things may or may not apply depending on your system. Okay, so in conclusion, so I present to you here today a recommended methodology that we used based on the Arcadia Capella method. Again, it was selected because out of the box, it had the focus on architecture I was looking for and needed. 
It had the elements in there that made modeling quick, error-free, and easy to learn, which is unique amongst modeling tools and languages. Uh, it's compliant with IEEE uh, 15288, and I would say more so than other competitive uh, or other optional uh, methods, tools out there. It really, like I said, that first step takes you holistically abstracting before you dive in, and that is a, a good solution in almost anything. Uh, the supplemental views were added to really complete it. Actually, one point I missed is that, you know, we also did a subset of views. You saw many were optional to really focus on the views that give, gave you the best return on investment. You know, there's a lot of optional views, and some of the views are pre-made from the views that are recommended here. Um, so there's a lot that you get and a lot of optional ones you could add but really we focused on the minimum set that gets you the robust system architecture at the best fidelity or the fidelity we need without doing a lot of extra other models or artifacts for the sake of doing them. The supplemental views complement those with programmatics, uh, some DODAP views which helped with the architectural context and they're somewhat, somewhat, I'd say globally accepted, especially the OV1. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. And it really is a good view and also assessment of the quality attributes and, you know, other elements of systems like risk opportunities and elements I mentioned in the previous slide. And you put it all together, you get a complete documented transdisciplinary architecture out of the end, which will go through the review and meet the customer's needs and get you the products, quite frankly, that you need. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Oh, and actually, this is the link. Uh, for those that are looking for the link to the uh, missing person locator model, you said, uh, it's here. Um, it's, it's version 6, so if you're using 6.1, you just got upgrade, but that's very straightforward. And also, after November, look for the IEEE RASI uh, 2023 proceedings for the paper that documents this methodology I just uh, showed you. So now I'll open up for questions. Thank you very much, Eric. I've just pasted the, the link in the chat for those of you who are interested. So you just have to click in, in the chat to see it. And now let's go to the questions and answer. We have a number of them. So let's go by boat, first of all. Um, here okay. is the most voted question. Sorry for the interruption. No, no, so no, state no. machines are not a first-class citizen in Arcadia and Capella, that's not nicely integrated. I'm surprised. How is your experience introducing this powerful modeling technique in your approach? Um, I mean, I guess I, I see the question. I mean, it's a, a very basic state machine diagram that you can create. But I think the importance is really to, once it's created, to then start defining what state-dependent functions are you deriving because they will need to you know typically software ends up paying for those down the road because they have to context switch based on you know what the inputs are but it really is to define those functions that are going to drive state depend their state dependent functions in your system um, i have not made had a state mode diagram that i thought was too too complicated to do with the tool Usually they're very, I'll say, basic and straightforward. Um, so I didn't find any, I didn't have an experience with not never being able to do the state mode exactly how I wanted to do it. But you do okay. have to, you know, you can, you do have to, I guess, manually make the link to the functions that are state dependent. And that goes back to the requirements, importance of that requirements piece. You know, you could actually use a requirement plugin in the tool and flag it as such, but as you output requirements, however you're gonna do it, it that's where it's really critical. And that's what gets you back to what I said, that 70% of a solid system right out of the gate. You gotta be doing requirements on every step. Okay, thank you, Eric. Next question, how, to customize Arcadia for small and medium-sized company, in your opinion? Well, I, I, not, to, not to sell my own wares here, but really that's why this methodology was developed, to get to, because, um, 
you know, Arcadia doesn't dictate you start here and you end here. You could start in the middle, you know, especially I didn't talk to architectural alternatives, but you can get to a spot and say, I don't know whether to do this or that. Maybe I have two different subsystem schemes in the logical architecture, how you could break that out and go further down. Um, but to me, the methodology that we just showed streamlined it for any size company. Um, and the only time I think you'd have issues, like I said, is if you take on an architecture that it's an enterprise level, because if you if you saw through the tools, you know, and I'll go back to one of my students wanted to do, you know, a model of the national defense. You know, I thought, how many operational capabilities would that be? How many activities would that be? How many level one fun? And it, it just you you couldn't do it. it. It's just too big. You could break it down and possibly get through it. I would say that's the only limitation, not on the small side, but on the large side that may force you to go to a tool that was specifically done for enterprise architecture. Okay, thank you. Next question is about Arcadia and Dodaf. So did you use Arcadia and Capella to address Dodaf services viewpoint? And if so, how did you do it? Well, I mean, the service view basically is related to software services, as you know. Here, the functionality where, where that would happen, it would be natural in that you derive the functions and in that last step when you allocate, some will be allocated to hardware and some will be allocated to software. And that really is the difference between your service views that you would have in, in, in Dodaf. So it, it, it's analogous to it is what I, I, I guess I'd maintain. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is about requirements, I guess. Let's see. Did you connect requirements with architecture element uh, with Capella? Uh, I have not. In, in my experience, we worked with doors. Um, so I went straight from the model uh, to doors. I have used the plugin. I haven't really used it on a full system. So I maybe aren't the best one to ask about that. But the requirements, you know, plugin is good because, as I said earlier in a few times, it's really critical that you define the requirements here. You know, and just for those familiar with the Denver luggage debacle and, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars wasted and just a really bad engineering story, you know, a lot of the write-ups called requirements failure. And I disagree. To me, that is a straight architecture failure. Because they never took the top level requirements that they got from an, from architecting this system, even at the customer level. So um, it really is critical. So whether you do it within the tool, you do it externally indoors. Um, don't 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 let me hear you use Excel, or I'll come knocking at your door and yell at you. But uh, uh, it, it's important to tie that in. That's a critical piece. That's what gets you that 70% that we want to aim for of a solid architected system. Okay, thank you. So next question, how many levels of function do you have in your model? It looks like uh, all the functions were defined at system analysis level. Um, that's, you'd have to zoom in a little bit because, you know, the, the, the progression is operational capability and then you have activities and that's up at the OAB then you're right, going from the activities to the, the SAB and decomposing the level one functions, that is, I'll say, a big step. However, when you get to the lab and break it up into subsystems and also start running those use cases through them, you are going to find functions that you missed. And I told this to my students, that's actually what they're, they're working on, the logical architecture and the threads this week. You will find functions. So those show up in, in, the, in the lab. And so it really is a good progression of them all the way through. So the biggest step, yes, I agree, is when you do the activities to level one functions. But there is another, I'll say, decent sized step or similar step in the logical architecture as well, especially as you do the threads. OK, thank you. Next question about Arcadia and ontologies. Does Arcadia have a defined and visible ontology? 
Um, I don't know if I'm the best one to answer that. I'd say some of the Obeo folks on the line have a better uh, yeah, start yeah, at that one. Yeah, the, the question doesn't seem really related to your talk, so sorry about that. But I don't, I'm not aware of any defined and visible ontology for the Arcadia. Arcadia uses a well-defined and documented meta model. And there was a talk by Jean-Luc Voir very recently uh, in this webinar series that presented uh, a set of resources that contains the Arcadia meta model among many other things. So I would recommend to go and look there. Right. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, next question. Uh, so are there any specific challenges that you encountered when using Capella for the non-technical aspects of socio-technical systems? Any open challenges not yet addressed by the method and tool, in your opinion? Uh, it's a good question. I have a limited sample there. I've had some, you know, obviously George Washington being in DC, we do, I'll say, more socio-technical than engineered systems, which is my background. So I had some students go through that. Um, they picked it out of the tool because of all the features I mentioned. They picked it up just as quick, even though some of them were more from, a, I'll say, non-systems, you know, almost a program management, engineering management type background. Um, but their social technical skills were actually quite good. The, the one thing that I found is that they typically used another tool, Vensim, in parallel with it. So like when they did the OEBD, there's a lot of nonlinearness uh, in some of the socio-technical systems and how the different organizations may interact. So they had to complement that OEBD with the Vensim model. And the Vensim model, for those familiar with it, you could actually put simple equations and simulate your system. It's actually a pretty nice tool. That's the only real, I'll say, drastic difference I saw when doing socio-technical systems. Okay, great. Next question. We still have a few minutes, so let's proceed. Uh, which would be the main advantages of Arcadia Capella compared to OPM? Uh, I've actually had that question before. When um, Again, I am not an OPM expert. Um, I don't believe OPM has the error checking and elements that we talked about that Capella does. Um, so that's primarily the main reason. That goes back to, as I addressed a lot of people, we, well, why not just use SysML and do this methodology? It does, it, you're, you're taking something generic, and OPM, I would say, fits this mold as well. You're taking something generic and abstracting it up to architecture. It's not made for that. Um, you know, I, when I tried that back when I was in industry, you know, I ended up sitting there having to stereotype things. And I, I'm just was thinking to myself, there's no way I could get the average engineer just to do this stuff. It's just, it shouldn't be this hard. So uh, I think the advantages I presented are going to hold true even to OPM, although I'm not an OPM expert. So I have to say that with a, you know, some, some more study would have to be done, but ease of modeling, speed to model, low learning curve. I, I just don't think anything's going to touch that because it was made specifically for architecture. Okay, next question. Once the system architecture is iterated and developed using Arcadia and Capella, how does it get translated down the line? I I'll let you read the rest. Okay. Okay, so this it's a very good question. Because um, this has evolved a lot. So if you ask me maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or eight years ago, I'd say, well, I you know, right now it really doesn't. However, uh, there's been a lot of work lately in like it in, Co in Cozy IS in Detroit, that, uh, I guess it would be a year, a little over a year ago, uh, Siemens showed some of their products where they take the Capella architecture and tie it into hardware design, firmware design, software design, um, very, very advanced, really polished looking, professional looking elements there to take Capella, quite frankly, down into design. Um, so there are elements out there that would let you do that. Um, we're setting up a lab that we're going to implement that next year here. Um, but that ties you right into simulation analysis. 
you know, it, it doesn't, I would say, have anything out of the box like SysML with the parametrics where you could do very rudimentary, uh, you know, parametrics, or you could make a call to MATLAB or Simulink or, you know, whatever you want to use. I think it doesn't have that out of the box, but with the, the elements that Siemens brings in, it's, it's just as comparable, if not more. And, and, and it's, you know, a big question on how do you best bridge any architecture method to design? Ideally, it would be one tool that's consistent. You know, Arcadia, certainly you could, you know, hierarchically work your way down. So like in the missing person locator, you know, the first subsystem really are the systems in the small system of systems. I could take that as a system onto itself and break it down where I'm deriving the subsystems. And at some point, if you keep doing that, you're, you're designed, you've crossed that threshold you're designing. So you could do it out of the box, even though that I don't think was the, its initial intent. Its initial intent was architecture. The way it's structured, you can keep, you know, burring it down. But I highly encourage you to see the, and, and I apologize, I can't think of the, their, the name of their product that tied into Capella. Very impressive. Very, very impressive. Okay. Uh, we'll just take one last question because time flies and all the other questions will be answered offline. So let's see. Do you envision that ingraining testability from the very start of modeling activities will help bridge the gap between MBSE and the existing model-based testing frameworks? Um, I mean, my, my motivation for that is to get the students thinking about testability. Um, they personally don't know, or, I mean, this is the first modeling they've been exposed to. And even at the company, I would say that's probably a, a true statement. So the key is that it gets in there so that as you're doing the functional decomposition, you, you have the elements that it ties to and you're going to get it because of that. Similar to how some of the value statements like MOSA, you know, resilience, you, you carry them along and make sure they're a ruler for each of your decisions that you make. Did you take it into account? So... I don't know if it's going to bridge the gap, but I think it's certainly a step in the right direction. I mean, if you're architecting a system and thinking tests and the various aspects of tests, that, that's a win. Okay. Well, thank you again very much, Eric, for this it's great presentation. Nice seeing you all. And, uh, well, see you soon on the next webinar.